All right, let's go ahead and kick things off. So hi, everyone. Thank you so much for tuning in today for our webinar with Analog Devices and Aero Electronics. I'm Brittany Nelson, Partnerships Manager at Indiegogo. And here with me today is Keaton Anderson, Engineering Manager at Aero. Analog Devices is the official semiconductor technology provider of the Aero Certification Program, enabling entrepreneurs to interpret the world around them with unmatched technologies that sense, measure, and connect. A quick note for our attendees, if you have any questions, please use the Q&A button at the bottom of the screen, and we'll try to address all of your questions at the end. All right, without further ado, Keaton, why don't we get started? Thanks, Brittany. Hi, everyone. My name is Keaton Anderson. As Brittany said, I am the engineering manager at Aero Electronics, uh, responsible for the Aero certification program. And I do a lot of work with Aero.com. Um, I have the, the absolute pleasure of getting to work with both analog devices and Indiegogo on a regular basis. So I'm really excited to get to take part in this. Um, one thing I did want to just disclaimer here. Uh, so my background is I am an electrical engineer. I've been with Arrow for seven years. Um, I've worked mostly as an applications engineer inside of our internal apps group. So I've done support for different projects that we're working on. Um, I've had a lot of uh, chances to get to work with different medical companies, um, anything from people doing uh, prosthetics and, and that kind of side to people making gloves that are detect ECG and EKG and so it's really it's been a lot of excitement for me but uh, my background is engineering I'm not a medical doctor so I'm excited to kind of go through some of this today um, if there's any questions or anything like that throw them into the uh, the Q&A um, so without further ado I'm going to go ahead and get started So the things I'm gonna to cover today are going to be an overview of medical devices. So this is just gonna talk a little bit about a couple of different devices that are currently being used in hospitals, things that might be kind of relevant to what is going on in the current uh, kind of global climate. Um, from there, I'm gonna talk a little bit about what are some of the challenges that go into medical design. So particularly for those who may have not done it before, what are some of the pitfalls and things that you could run into that might be a bit challenging? Uh, from there, I want to talk a little bit about Analog Devices Medical Solutions. So Analog Devices is a company that, as Brittany had talked about, they're a primary provider for us for the Aero Certification Program. And what they really bring to the table is precision and they really bring high quality. And so I want to talk a little bit about how their technology plays within a signal chain environment for medical solutions and what might be some really necessary things to look into when you're kind of building in that space. And then the last thing we're gonna talk a little bit about is the Aero Certification Program. This is really helpful if you're going to be building anything in this space or just in general, if you're working on an electronic product. Um, we have engineers who work on this on a daily basis. And like I said, I've, I've had the real pleasure and opportunity to, to get to work with a lot of companies who are designing in this space. Um, and so I think it can be definitely a big help as we're going through and uh, working with these different companies and, and, and potentially your project as well. So it, let's go ahead and dive into medical device overview. So we're gonna be talking a little bit about ventilators, um, an electrocardiogram, infusion pumps, and infrared temperature sensors. So at the top of the list here, I wanted to talk a little bit about ventilators and, and those, it, it was something that I had noticed had been coming up quite a bit in terms of the news and, and what was kind of the key focus for a lot of activities. And I'd heard a lot about different designs. MIT had done a design for a ventilator for $100. Um, and so it really started to pique my interest around what exactly goes into this device and, and what is kind of the needed and necessary components for it. So um, essentially what a ventilator is, is it's an assisted breathing device that is used for uh, patients who have reduced or damaged lung capacity. And, and what the device will end up doing is it's going to create a specific mixture of normal air using the surrounding air and oxygen. So this way we can be able to make sure that the patient's getting the correct amount of oxygen when it's breathing in. And what the, the ventilator will do is it actually is going to help force air into the lungs um, for a patient through a breathing tube and it'll help assist them in breathing. And I, you know, it was one of those things that when I first started reading up on this, it was kind of a, a big, a little bit of a shock because I think I had just had assumptions around what the devices are, but these definitely, 
they both help force the air in and pull that carbon dioxide out. So it's going to assist with moving air in and out of the lungs and also making sure that it's maintaining that particular uh, mixture of air that is used for kind of normal breathing. Um, and these devices, they're not really intended to treat or cure medical conditions. They're more used to fight in dire circumstances. And I think that's become kind of very evident from a lot of it, but I thought it was just something, you know, it's not intended to be a permanent replacement. Um, obviously, you know, there's been some devices that have been developed that are more for long-term use, but this is something that they're really trying to, it, you're fighting a particular thing. So um, really interesting. We'll talk a little bit about a signal chain and how that looks for ventilators a little later. Um, so we'll kind of cover a little bit more into in depth on those. Uh, the next one I'm going to look at is an ECG, and I apologize, again, I'm an engineer, not an artist, so these are crude renderings, but um, an, an electrocardiogram is used to record the electric signals inside of a patient's heart, and this was really interesting because it kind of takes the en entire uh, view of, of what a electric circuit might look like and kind of breaks your body down into that. So your heart is going to produce electrical signals and this essentially goes in and monitor those. So um, these are commonly used to detect heart problems and determine what the heart's health is like. So you can see if there's um, irregular uh, pumping going through the heart or if there's a regular, uh, like a murmur or something like that, these are often used to be able to detect those signals. Um, and you can kind of set the system up with a lot of wires. This is just showing a three wire and this isn't you know, completely it, but the idea being that you're going to put um, electrodes on different places on the body to be able to measure what the electrical, uh, what the electrical pass through of the heart is producing. Um, and this can go up to, I think a lot of common setups are using 12 wires. We'll show uh, an example a little bit later for that as well. Kind of just talking about how these electrical signals are being taken in and what signal conditioning you may have to do for those. Um, these leads are gonna again, look at the electrical voltages uh, within the chest to monitor the different cycles of heartbeat. Um, and they can also be taken by wearables like watches. So uh, I thought this was really interesting. Technology has come out for like a single lead uh, ECG, EKG. And so you'll see on like some of the newer version of Apple watches, they'll, you'll be able to kind of take a, a, a low grade version to see what the heart pulses is. Um, many of those ov obviously for liability perspective are saying, hey, uh, these are not like, don't, don't use this as the final word. But it, it's just really interesting to see how a technology that had been kind of uh, used more in just the traditional hospital setting is becoming more and more embedded into daily technology. And I think that uh, that's kind of a theme that you're going to see throughout design as it goes into the next couple of years. I think as things get smaller, as it becomes more common, you're going to get a lot more people who are building more wearable size things that were for traditional large scale medical devices down into more of a small range. The next one we'll talk about is infusion pumps. So infusion pumps are used to be able to uh, transport uh, fluids or nutrients into a patient's body. Um, I'm gonna look at this from two different perspectives. So I'm gonna talk a little bit about the, the high end of it, uh, excuse me, the larger devices, and then more of a smaller scale in insulin pumps in a particular. Um, so infusion pumps are used at, uh, are available at the bedside of probably about 90% of patients within hospital. Um, and the rise of chronic disease, they continue to drive demand for these. Um, one thing that's been a key factor for infusion pumps is reducing safety errors. So there's a long history with infusion pumps having safety issues. Um, and, and so they're, they're constantly being monitored by the FDA. It's, it's been a big initiative for them to try to do it. Um, IV infusion had been associated with 54% of um, adverse drug events. So it was, it was really interesting to kind of see that this is an area that's a key focus. Obviously, anytime you're delivering to, to the body, um, what you're putting in there is really important. And so that's an area of big focus. Um, when we look at it from insulin pumps and kind of a smaller thing, insulin pumps are actually really fascinating because the technology on these has really rapidly developed within the last uh, 20, 30 years. And so you can see a device where um, the patient is actually going to be on site with them. That'll typically hang um, with them. They can have it as like on their belt or in their pocket or something like that. Um, and, and the wire here isn't particular, if you could see in the diagram to where it normally is. Sometimes patients will embed them in their hips um, or the upper leg area um, where they can be able to inject the medicine. And those will deliver, um, uh, they'll use a mechanical action to push insulin through a tube into the patient's body. And that can typically, the, the insulin block will consist of 
multiple different pieces. So you'll have a control module, a reservoir where the insulin's contained, and an infusion set for delivery. And typically what they'll do is they'll take user input and they're gonna dose the correct amount of bolus and basal insulin to lower blood sugar. So what you could see here is it's a more of a small form factor that started to become uh, a little bit more modernized and that you have touchscreen inputs and you're going to be able to kind of review. Uh, what's been really fascinating for me about insulin pumps is that they have taken kind of a little bit more of an IoT twist on them. So not only are the devices now able to pass insulin before a user might have to go in and manually input their numbers, manually take their blood sugar, um, these are now being partnered with continuous blood glucose monitors. So with that, you'll have it where typically they can go into like an arm or somewhere on the body where the, uh, it'll be a needle that'll go in and it's connected to a sensor. And that sensor actually goes through and continues to monitor the blood glucose levels and uses a transceiver to communicate with that insulin pump. So instead of the user constantly having to go in, hey, what did I have for lunch today? What did I have for breakfast? They, they still will want to communicate that to the device, but the device actually will monitor when are we seeing a spike and try to manage it more in real time. Um, and, and, and that helps you kind of avoid doing a little bit what you had seen with that area traditionally in the past is that you would do this kind of up and down nature where um, if you didn't get the correct doses right, sometimes you'd give too much insulin and then the, the uh, patient's blood sugar would dip a little low. They'd have to correct and eat something or consume a little sugar or, or uh, glucagon, you know, things that were going to be able to help raise the blood sugar. And then you'd be trying to bring it back down. So you were doing a lot of cyclic nature um, with insulin and, and blood glucose. So again, it's a really fascinating area because you have a technology that um, I think if you look back long history, traditionally was not going to be as available for patients, now being carried in more of a small form factor and starting to, to monitor itself. You know, this is the ability to be able to now use data that is being provided and collected by these devices to make intelligent decisions and, and help kind of make a, a patient's life a little easier instead of having to constantly go through and monitor. And, and obviously, uh, the main use for the insulin pumps is going to be for type 1 diabetics, but, you know, I think what you can see with the growth in the medical space is that you really have the opportunity, and I think you will see in the next couple of years, to take some of these traditionally larger medical devices and bring them to that smaller form factor that uh, might be more accessible for everyday patients. And then the last one that we want to talk about um, is infrared temperature sensors. So I <laughs> this is actually a little bit more of a, a personal one. So uh, we, as we come into the office, they're starting to do more temperature checks to be able to kind of go through. And I thought it was interesting. I wanted to understand how these contactless temperature sensors work. Um, so what these are going to do is they're going to use the IR waves coming off of an object, and they're going to have a reference point to be able to determine what that, that temperature looks like. So the IR waves will travel from the person, and there's an IR sensor on in the temperature sensor that's going to take the IR waves that are coming in, and it'll convert it to electricity. So it'll give a particular voltage that'll say, here's how what the relative um, relative amount of waves are coming in. Now, obviously, as you could imagine, different the objects will put out different waves. So what will happen here is the waves that are being measured are actually going to be associated with the emissivity of the object or how, how readily it gives off those waves. And it'll use that to, to uh, determine temperature. So if you could imagine um, the human body will have a particular emissivity associated with it, um, it'll put off a certain amount of waves. And from there, you're able to correlate that to an electrical value that you can then use as a reference to see hey, what the temperature is of the object. Um, these devices typically have a ratio. So it'll be, if it's one to one, it'll say, hey, it'll take a one inch radius at one inch away from the device. Um, and they, but they can go out further. You could have one that's 12 to one, or um, they might have a, a maximum range. If you could imagine with these, um, let's say I'm trying to take a temperature of somebody and it's too far away, you're starting to collect some of the ambient radiation that's coming in there. So um, that's one of the things why if you're seeing people holding them and it looks a little close sometimes, that's part of what it's trying to do is, is correlate what the actual infrared that's coming off of them um, is, and then taking that to make a temperature value. Um, and so again, these, these are kind of being used a little bit more commonly here. You're going to see it. Um, one thing that I thought was interesting that I did note was uh, just given the fact that these are taking kind of the rays off a surface, it's not as accurate as 
a traditional method. And the reason that is, is because you're just looking at the surface of the object. So uh, if for some reason you were to have it where it was, ex you know, you had an external extremely hot or something like that, these, they typically won't recommend that you use these in like sunlight and areas like that um, in order to be able to make sure that you're getting the most accurate measurements. So some of your more traditional thermometers, um, kind of the under the tongue, in ear, stuff like that, those are going to be a little bit more accurate. So just something to keep in mind as you're, you're kind of, using these. Um, they're a really great way to make sure that you're maintaining contact, contactless um, temperature taking, but they can be a little bit not as accurate. And we'll talk a little bit later about why accuracy can be really important. So with that, uh, I, I wanted to talk a little bit about what are some of the challenges that are in medical design. So here's some of the, those are some of the new and, and interesting devices that are kind of relevant to, to today. I want to talk a little bit about what are some of the challenges with getting new devices to come through. So I know a lot of the people that we meet with from the Aero Certification Program, they have a really great new idea. They have a, a, probably something that's very cutting edge. They're helping shrink technology. Um, in a lot of circumstances there though, this is a big uncharted area and it's, it, it can be a little daunting. So let's talk a little bit about FDA approval. So FDA approval has a couple of different classifications that these devices fall in. So you'll look at class one, class two, and class three. And I'm actually gonna start with class three and I'll work my way back up because it's a little bit easier to understand. Um, but what you'll end up having to do is submit different documentation associated with your project based on the ranking that you're, you're classifying your device at. Um, so, sorry, I'm gonna actually start with class one. Um, so these ones, the what you're looking at with class one devices are your low risk devices. So these are bandages, non-electric wheelchairs, surgical masks, gloves, things that are just going to be associated in a medical environment, but aren't necessarily going to be at risk or invasive to a patient. Um, many times when we're talking with people, one of the things that we'll bring up is, as you go further up the classification scale, it becomes more and more dangerous, more and more challenging from a, a liability perspective. So um, I'll talk a little bit about this later, but keeping in the, the lower classifications can really help in terms of expediting your product to market. The second class is going to be your medium risk devices. So these are things like CT scans, infusion pumps, and syringes. And so what you're starting to see at this point is the devices are now starting to potentially interact with the human body in more of a insertion or invasive way. Um, obviously those ones, they're still kind of trying to keep at the medium risk. So we're not completely uh, overtaking a, a function of the body, but we do have a circumstance here where we're engaging with it and there's potential for error. So that really does uh, jack up the risk a little bit there. And then class three is going to be things that are considered important for sustaining life. So these are things like pacemakers, defibrillators, and ventilators, like we just talked about. These are the highest risk, but also the highest reward as they're super critical to maintaining a function of the body. So um, for example, there, like a pacemaker is going to be able to help keep the heartbeat uh, typical, or a defibrillator is gonna be able to use to shock and try to bring back uh, a correct rhythm of the heart or, or jolt a heart that stop, as well as, you know, a ventilator we had just talked about was kind of maintaining breathing, helping a patient who might not be able to. So um, really with people who are wanting to first start and a first design, if anything in the space, I would recommend trying to keep it class one. Um, as I said, we'll talk a little more about that later. The second piece of that is the certifications aspect. And this is one that you could easily spend months and months researching and not even cover 1% of what goes into it. So certifications that go into the device um, are on a couple of different spectrums. So one, you're going to have to look at both the intention and the purpose, as well as the electrical characteristics. And obviously there's more that go into mechanical and such, but just from a electrical perspective, we're just going to cover on this spectrum right now. So an example of this is IEC 6061-1. Um, and this is a general requirement standard for basic safety and essential performance. And an example of that one is 1-1-3. And I, I'm not joking you, this can go on, this list is like, you know, hundreds of items longs of just particular for certain devices. So the 1-1-3 is particular for just x-rays, but that standard talks about particulars for different types of medical devices. And so you'll need to be able to make sure that when you're looking at making a, a particular device, you wanna start to think about what are the safety standards associated with it? Um, I, 
to talk to the next point. If there's a power requirement associated with these, particularly if you're looking at anything that's going to interact with the body electrically, electrically um, these often will carry isolation standards with that. And the big reason for that is that if you have electricity that's going to be in interacting with the human body, there's some real uh, bad interactions that could happen from burning and um, too much current passing through the body. Um, so there's some really key things that are needed from isolators. And so there are standards like um, UL 1577 that talks about optical isolators. There's other ones from UL and CE which put out a lot of standards for electrical equipment. You'll typically see a UEL or a CE badge on um, different electrical products you're using, things from like, you know, home toasters to um, desktop computers, stuff like that. They'll all carry different certifications with it. And so it, it just depends on the amount of power that you're trying to go through the device. A lot of your um, power companies will, when they're making their devices, they'll certify it to a certain standard. So if you're looking to do a particular power range, you may be able to find a device that's pre-certified or will help you kind of get further along to that certification. But there's definitely something that you want to try to keep in mind with these, which is to make sure that you're keeping them at the forefront of your design. Uh, otherwise, they're going to become very challenging to engage with later on. You don't want to have to try to backtrack and figure out, hey, we never thought about how we isolate the human body. That's, that's going to be a hard area to, to work from. And then my suggestions for success with these. Um, so one is going to be the classification. And I touched on this earlier, but um, in some of the campaigners that we've worked with in the past, they'll talk a little bit about, hey, I'm designing for a medical environment. And in almost all of those interactions, the, the first conversation that happens is that they're saying, hey, we're trying to aim to make sure that we're class one. We don't wanna be invasive in the human body. We wanna make sure that we are providing a function that is useful, but we don't necessarily want to dig too far. And that's because the, the deeper you go, it's going to really be a lot more stringent from a testing perspective. You're going to have a lot more challenges um, that are going to be a little bit more difficult in terms of being able to secure getting your device out to market. And I know when we're talking with entrepreneurs in particular, um, this is an area that is a big challenge. You know, you have a certain amount of capital available, you're trying, or you're, maybe you're just doing it in your garage, trying to figure it out. Um, in a lot of those circumstances, you wanna make sure that you're optimizing your time as best as possible. Number two is similarity. And this was one that kind of surprised me a little bit. So, you know, a lot of times when we talk to campaigners, one of the things that we've told them is, hey, try to find something that's completely or radically different. You know, you want to have your hook, you want to have your thing to be able to get it into market. And that maintains true from a product viability perspective. Um, but from an FDA perspective, if you have something that is similar to another device, um, if you're able to point and say, hey, it looks or acts to something like that, the testing that's being asked of it is not as stringent as it is in other ways. So they'll know the tests that are being provided for those. They'll probably want to go through a similar one. Um, so similarity is actually to your benefit in some ways when you're passing through. If you can at least be able to say, hey, here's here's a device you probably want to be able to look at that's similar, um, it, it will help you in terms of going through that design process. And then the last one I'm going to talk about is using high quality. And honestly, I can't stress this enough. So when we're looking at uh, a realm of maybe more consumer products or you know kind of typical toys it, it can be a little bit sometimes of hey I'm, i recognize that i'm trying to hit a price point i'm trying to sell for a certain area um, and and we're looking really at how do we optimize a bomb cost how do we try to make sure we're getting the most bang for our buck um, in in this circumstance you really got to try to aim for high quality because you're dealing with an area that it is potentially very liable, very risky in some of the ways. Uh, if, you know, with some of your wearables and stuff like that, you're starting to put batteries and devices next to the human body. And so that can be very, very, very challenging from an interaction. You want to make sure that you're using the top quality components, you're using the top quality of devices so that you can make sure that when you're handing this to someone, you could say, hey, this was built the best way that I know could. We know that it's going to be quality. We're not worried about after 10 years, are we going to see any degradation? Um, it's, it's definitely something that we want to make sure that you're considering from day one is how do I make sure that I'm building with things that I know that are going to last and have high precision and performance. So with that, I do want to talk a little bit about uh, a company that I consider to be at the forefront of high precision and performance. So um, analog devices is our 
partner. They, they help us out in a, a lot of different ways for the program perspective. Um, I've had a lot of really great interaction with these guys. They've provided experts to help review campaigns before. Um, and we've looked at all sorts of different applications. They've helped us with power trees. Um, I can't say enough good things about analog devices. And so I'm really excited to get to talk a little bit about some of their products today as they look in terms of uh, medical kind of awareness. Um, but first, I, I want to talk a little bit about why is precision important, especially in this realm. So um, this will dive a little bit into theory here. If this section gets a little bit too confusing, don't worry, we'll, we'll get past it here in a bit. But I just want to talk a little bit about this from a um, bits and bytes perspective. So if we're looking at a converter that has a certain level of precision, oftentimes you'll see it says it's 8 bits or 12 bits or 14. Um, and so what does that really equate to? And so let's pretend that we're doing a temperature reading between 105, or excuse me, 95 and 105 degrees. And obviously this Fahrenheit, you could apply the same logic for Celsius, but I'm kind of aiming here to talk a little bit about human body temperature. So what we look at with bits is we talk about how many possible options are there. So um, in many of these devices, you're going to be coding in binary. So your options for a one bit of precision would be a zero and a one. So what that equates to from a temperature perspective is one bit of precision says, I can see it's either a zero or a one. Zero would then be a 95 degrees where one is going to be 105 degrees. So in this area, you really don't have that much area to say, hey, we know what the object is. It's between one or the two. If it's somewhere in between, it's either a zero or a one. Um, so obviously when you go up in that, you're gonna have, if you look at to the second or two bits of precision, your options are zero, 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 one, one, zero, or one, one. And so those equate to, from a temperature perspective, something to the effect of 95, 98.3, 101.6, 105. And this is kind of just being very general about it. Um, obviously you could code them to say that you want it to be a different temperature range when you're coding that, but I'm just talking about what it would look like from a, a precision bit. So if we move up to the next scale of it from three bits of precision, what you'll start to see now is that I'm being able to analyze a little bit closer. So this is giving me 1.25 degrees of variance in between each one. And that's the analog scale compared to the digital readings that we're looking at. So in this circumstance, Something to note though, is that you have 98.75 degrees, which is really pretty close to a normal human body temperature and 100 degrees, which is often considered a fever. And so in that circumstance, this is obviously still not enough bits of precision. And if you have any sort of drift or any sort of, you didn't get the right bit or you sampled or something like that, you can really start to see how this could potentially get off. And so if we look at something like 16 bits of precision, if you see a 16 bit converter, that's 65,536 options. And what that looks like is you'll take 95 degrees and then you'll have 95.00015 all the way up to 104.9998 there's a couple other decimal places there, and then 105. And so as you could imagine, now your temperature variance is, you know, 98.000, so on and so forth, instead of it being such a, a wide variance. And so precision becomes really important. And, and while you may say, hey, this is silly from a temperature perspective, we're only really dealing with 10 degrees total. When you start to look at passing milliliters of a solution or, um, you know, if you're working in nano amps or something like that, those are 10 to the negative uh, three, 10 to the negative nine. Those are really, really, really precise measurements. And so it's important that you're not, you're not gonna have a device that you're feeling like, hey, I don't have the level of precision to get the data that I need. And so one of the reasons that we, I like to talk about along devices is that they have really high precision devices and they're really helpful in terms of being able to walk you through what some of that design flow looks like. So as an example, Let's talk a little bit about what signal chain looks like. So a signal chain is how a signal coming from a device is going to be conditioned for different purposes. So let's say I have an example, I have a noise. Uh, this could be a child shouting or a singer or something like that. Um, and that's gonna go into a microphone. So we're getting raw analog input there. Um, from there, we are gonna run it through a low pass filter. So this is an example of one step of a signal chain. So you don't wanna have noise that's coming in fading into the signal. Let's go ahead and just filter out some of that high end. So this would be the frequencies that are gonna cause the screeching and everything like that. We're gonna just chop those out. We're just gonna let through the, the low noise, the area that we're focusing on. 
And we're going to go ahead and sample that to be able to get the pieces of the data that we're looking for. And we're going to pass that into an analog to digital converter. So this is going to take those oscillations and frequency of sound waves and convert them into bits and bytes and be able to say, hey, a song is actually just a stream of, you know, uh, inner, uh, binary numbers that are essentially saying, what are the levels of different pieces of harmonics? Um, that is then potentially passed into storage. So let's say I'm recording something, we could put that into kind of a, a memory bank and that says, hey, here's where all my, my bits and bytes live. If I'm going the opposite direction, I might use, so I'm gonna recall my storage and put it from a digital into analog converter. So this is going to take all of those hexadecimal bits, um, you have your binary, and it's going to then convert it into analog signals. And we're gonna run that again through a low pass filter. So this is part of the interesting bits about signal chain is that when you're going through this, you're going to actually have to do probably multiple different steps. You'll do an amplification step, you may have to do a noise uh, removal step, then you're probably doing another amplification step. There's different pieces that go into that. Um, so for this example, we will take and go ahead and run that into an amplifier that will then play out from a speaker. So this whole process that we're going through is, is talking about the signal chain. It's how we condition a signal. It's how we take data and translate it from one level to another. It's how we take analog data, get it to digital and, and vice versa. So let's look at an example from a medical environment. So this is looking at an ECG with respiration. So uh, this is a lot of different blocks here. We'll try to talk through each of them. Um, on the left, what you're gonna see is a patient and we're talking about a couple of different electrodes there. So if you'll see, there's one on the right arm, the left arm, the right leg and the left leg. Um, and then you have a couple of different places where you're placing electrodes, the V1 through six on that device. So we're actually gonna be able to get very precise measurements of the electrical signal going through the body. And that's gonna pass into an analog front end converter. Um, so this will have a voltage reference, an acquisition path, a respiration path. And I'm actually gonna dig a little bit deeper into this particular block. So what you'll see from this, and this can be a lot of uh, blocks if you haven't seen one before, is we have a couple of different things here. So on the left-hand side, you're gonna see we have our leads coming in from uh, the left arm, the left leg, the right arm, and our V1 and V2. And those will go into a multiplexer. So they're gonna be able to help us determine and uh, take a look at those signals um, and be able to act upon them based on the signals that are coming in. And then all of those have an amplifier and an analog to digital converter. So we're gonna be able to take the information we're getting from those leads, we're gonna boost it up a little bit so we can see it, and then we're gonna convert it from analog into digital. And from there, it'll go into that filter control and interface logic. And that enables us to start being able to do computery things. And so this really kind of starts to bridge the gap of taking information around a patient, something that's analog, converting it into a digital format and then being able to act on it based on the information that is presented. And so what you'll see on the right hand side here is a picture of what this actually looks like. So the ADAS 1000 evaluation board has an, uh, the main board there that's green that's gonna handle the processing. It'll have a five volt wall adapter to be able to provide power to the device. And then on the left side, you're gonna see that the patient cable. So that's where those uh, leads that are coming in, they're actually going to feed that data into it. It's gonna go through the application, converting into digital. And then on the right-hand side, we actually have a board that's connected to be able to then pass that information via USB cable to the PC. So this takes um, what could be traditionally a larger scale patient data, it boils it into the computer and now we can start to make decisions based on what information we're seeing. Um, so this is part of how you would see a front end that's going to convert this. But as you can see from the left hand side, there is a lot of different blocks that go into this. So instead of trying to design something like that from scratch, getting an analog front end, something that can be able to go in and convert those signals and give you out relevant information is a really useful piece so that you're not having to go through and trying to design something from scratch. Um, this just helps kind of immediately jump into taking acquisition from data and being able to start making decisions based on that. So going back to our block, so we interacted with that front end there. Um, well, the next thing we're gonna see is that processor band. So I'm gonna talk a little bit about what kind of processor would look, what could look like there. Um, so in this case, the product that they had featured was the ADSP 523. Um, so this is a low power black friend processor and it has advanced peripherals. And so one of the things that's really interesting about this device is that it has a hardware enabled security for code and content protection. Um, this is really important when you start to think about things like HIPAA compliance, being able to make sure you're keeping your patient's data secure, being able to monitor and protect 
knowing that that's built in. Um, so you're obviously going to have the performance, you know, as the next line that we're talking a little bit about, it's going to run up at 600 megahertz. It's going to have good performance, still operating, obviously, at that low power range. But then that security that's built in makes sure that we're keeping that device confidential. No one's going to be able to do any lead testing or probing to be able to see, hey, what's going on in there. That helps kind of make, maintain that privacy. Um, and then obviously, you're going to want to make sure that when you're working with anything like this, you have a host of different connectivity options. So this will have UARTs, sports, spies, things like that to be able to communicate. All right, one more time back to this diagram. Um, so the last thing I want to look at here is going to be the power. Um, so from the processor, you're going to be able to put out the display. Um, there's built-in uh, backlight drivers and battery power. Both of those are offered by ADI. I'm going to talk just a little bit about these blocks, the power blocks for them. Um, I My background is power engineering. So in many ways, I'm sure a lot of people think this is like the least interesting thing for it. Um, but power is obviously really important when it comes to, to medical and maintaining a proper signal. So these devices, um, as you can see there, we have two different forms. I have a chip scale package and one with leads. Um, this is going to have uh, VM that will come in, you're going to have an enabled shutdown that will look for uh, short circuit, low voltage, thermal protect, um, and you're going to be able to then use a reference to make sure that you're getting out absolute, you know, uh, as close to the value that you need from a VL perspective. Um, power signal and being able to pass and, and make sure that you're getting the right voltage levels is really important. Um, as you could imagine, if you go too high, you could have real trouble with electrical on your board, too low, and you won't be able to power your devices. Um, so these are some kind of really interesting blocks that are going into building out that whole path. This is the whole example of a signal chain of just acquiring that front end data, being able to display it out, process it, um, and then communicate it. Obviously, they're on the far, far inside you see. You could then use Bluetooth or a transmitter and receiver to be able to then communicate that data to um, different devices. And, and that's really what we're starting to see with that IoT is taking this information, being able to backhaul it, start to do advanced processing on it, and make it smart decisions based on the device um, and, and, and the information that you're getting. Okay, so I'm gonna talk a little bit to kind of come full circle about a ventilator signal chain. So I showed you kind of the basic block of just kind of collecting sound. This is a little bit more intense. Um, so if you'll see here, we have the full layout of it. And, and what you'll see is we'll have both the intake and exhale valve there. Those will have uh, flow sensors, humidity sensors, temp sensors. There's the motor that's hooked up there to be able to pass in and out. You'll see there on the left-hand side, we have both the air intake and the oxygen to be able to help set that level. So this could get really very uh, complex very quickly. Um, one of the things that's nice though, and, and one, again, one of the reasons I like partnering with ADI is that they have offerings that cross the entire board here. So if you look at it, they have um, you know pieces for the front end to be able to take the ECG. They're gonna be able to then look at the transceiver. You can do backlight control, capacitive touch for the screens, isolators. I could really go on and on here. Um, but essentially, if you get to a place where you're saying, hey, this seems really complex. This seems like something I'm interested in. We're trying to build something like that, but we're not 100% sure where to go. Let us know. That's part of, uh, and I'll talk a little bit here in a second about the Aero Certification Program. But we have block diagrams for this. We have block diagrams for in vitro, for kidney dialysis. Um, there are, are different ways to be able to, to look at through this. And instead of trying to redesign an entire signal chain, um, one of the great things about getting to work in kind of the technology industry is and a lot of times these have been done before or done in a different application. And you can awfully, often take some of that information, be able to pass it in and, and be able to use that for your own design. And so um, th they definitely have a lot of different blocks that you can be able to use. And it's something we would definitely love to hear about what you're working on and try to help you move and, and design that signal chain um, so you don't have to go at it on your own. So with that, I want to talk a little bit about the Aero Certification Program um, in terms of the program overview and the benefits. Um, this is part of the program that I work on. So the Aero Certification Program is our way to be able to engage people designing new products or those who just have technology questions and try to help them kind of move along the path. So a designer who's working might have to start at the ideation phase. You have a new idea, but you're not really sure what to do with it. Um, the next stage of that would then obviously be the prototyping. And this is part of the area that Arrow can help get you get involved with your product. So if you need help with in terms of, hey, I'm not quite sure what I should be doing for PowerTree here, or I'm not quite sure how I might go about 
um, what, what level of precision I need or, or something along those lines. Uh, the prototyping step is really important in terms of your design. This is where you're gonna spend a lot of time trying to get something up quickly, but then also going through the iterations to be able to um, eventually get to your, your product release. And um, the step down there you'll see later is product iterations. That's talking a little bit more about a post launch product. It'll start to look at more of different waves like your Apple Watches one, two, three, four. Um, we're talking right here particularly about the product iterations that go into getting your product ready for launch. Um, at that point in time, when you've reached a MVP, a minimal viable product, when you feel like, hey, we're ready to start pushing, that's when you could look at something doing like a product launch. And obviously, like I've done full webinars that go into just about prototyping, just about bill of materials, just about getting your products out. This is a long discussion, but make sure that you have your product ready to go because we recommend that um, as soon as you put that up, people are ready to start seeing it. You're gonna have to start delivering on a timeline. It's really important stuff. Um, from there, your product will go into full production and that's when you start to do the producing, the manufacturing, that's another area that Aero can help provide support. Um, and then obviously we can help with both the product iterations and end of life. We have dedicated people who kind of work through this on a daily basis. So um, all of this to say, people who have worked with the Aero certification program, they typically raise 87% more funds than those who have not, and they're four times more likely to reach their goals. So we're really proud about what we've built here. We're really proud to be partnered with Indiegogo and Analog Devices, um, and we're really excited to get to see what the, the next wave of products is going to look like. So just to highlight a quick couple benefits for the program, um, if you have Aero certified technology on your program, you're going to be able to get up to $1,000 off of components and services. Um, you're going to be able to get some extra social media attention and newsletter promotion. I obviously kind of talked a little bit about this, but the engineering and manufacturing support as well as supply chain and logistics. So we can help you in terms of what questions you might have, what things are more technical, as well as being able to get you uh, moving in the right direction and as, as, uh, help you with manufacturing. Where's the first place to go to get my first run done? How should I be looking at scale? What are some of the optimizations that are going to have to be made to my bomb for scale? <laughs> There's a lot of different things that can go into that. Um, and then the last thing is going to be the badge for your campaign page. So we talked a little bit about this, but um, this enables you to say, hey, I've brought my project through. People have seen that Arrows had a chance to look over it, make sure that it has that, that level that we say, hey, we think that this product is, is feasible. It's ready to, to go. Um, and this is an area that, especially just given a lot of the new medical devices that are going to start to come through, um, it's going to be important for people to say, hey, I know I can, can trust and verify that. And I know um, Brittany will probably talk a little bit about what some of the requirements are on those um, here in a second. So um, just my, my advice would be on this, if you have a new product idea, we'd really love to get in touch with you. We'd really love to hear about what you're working on. Um, I really appreciate everyone's time. Uh, there's a link here to be able to go and join the program. It's also available on arrow.com if you click on Indiegogo and go to apply now. Um, the program's there as well. Uh, and I'm happy to answer any questions. So with that, I'm going to pass it back to you, Brittany. Awesome. Thank you so much, Keaton. All right, we've got a couple of quick questions here. A few around the the temperature check kind of sensor thing. Mm -hmm. The first question, I don't know if you know the answer to this or not, but do you know why the temperature sensor is directed on the head specifically? Um, so the <laughs> my understanding of this is that it's one of the areas that you have the the least amount of uh, things that are potentially going to be able to get in the way and it's an area that is easy to get the emissivity from um i don't i'm not for sure on it but my understanding is that it's really easy and for people they're able to um, be able to engage with that so they can understand hey someone's being able to come to my head and take the temperature um, but other areas of your body you'll see that there are um, potential in terms of just the way that blood's flowing and stuff like that. So if you have a set point where you tell people, hey, this is where you go to take the temperature, um, that enables you to be able to get a more precise emissivity of what that area is going to look like. So I think it's somewhat just in terms of tuning and precision for the device. And also it's partly um, just for being able to have patient awareness. But again, that's just my, my hunch. That makes sense. That makes sense. Uh, follow up to that. Do you know the cost of the device for the, the temperature sensor check? So I've seen them on Amazon going from anywhere like 50 to $100, I think, for those thermometers. And don't quote me on that. 
Um, the biggest piece that goes into creating one of these is going to be your infrared temperature sensor. So that's the thing that if you were to pull one of these open, what you'd see is you'd have a module at the start that will take all the infrared rays that are coming in, and then it will go ahead and convert that into, and it's a thermovial that's going, you're going to use to convert that from radiated energy into electricity. So that's the biggest element that goes in there. There's a couple of other things you'll typically see in one of these devices, like you're going to have a screen display to be able to show the user what the temperature is. You're going to have some power elements in there, probably charging for batteries, things like that. That's the biggest one, but that's about the range that I've seen them at so far. Got it. Got it. Okay. Um, I think this has to do with uh, around the, the certifications. Mm -hmm. Do you know, are there isolation standards for GSR as in biofeedback? Um, so, <laughs> <laughs> so I'm not, I'm not hard so sure. My, my guess is that typically there is yes. Um, I'm, I'm, I'd have to look that one up in particular. That's something we could help with. But typically anytime that you're engaging with any sort of uh, feedback or any sort of patient interaction, even uh, this is kind of like a silly thing, but like your your devices, like your Apple Watches and your phones and stuff, they're going to have uh, standards around like radiation and stuff. So even if it's not from an electrical isolation perspective, you'll probably have some from a, a different perspective. So um, that's probably one that I would have to take more offline to do a little deeper dive into that research. But my guess is that if you can think of it, there's probably a standard around it, sadly. Got it. Got it. Okay. And then another question here, do you at Aero or um, analog devices work with lasers at all? So soft laser, microcurrent or tunable lasers? So that is an area that I know that um, for sure that we, we do, we see applications for. I know that's something that I've talked before with some of my contacts, uh, Rick, even at analog devices about some of what they do from that perspective. So um, there's definitely an area that, that they engage from that perspective. Um, some of it will be just in terms of optical and those pieces, but definitely that's an area that, that we could have some support for you. And we'd love to hear about those projects. They're really cool. Yeah, definitely. Um, okay, there's a couple questions here. I think just clarifying on the, the FDA different classes. So there's one question asking if N95 masks and ventilators are in the same class or if there's something different. And then there's another question here about EKG machines and wondering what classification that would be in. Yeah, so um, your N95 masks are going to be, assuming they're a static mask and you're not doing any sort of um, operation or tubes connected or anything like that, those are gonna fall into the lowest class for them. So those are gonna be um, the ones that are gonna be the lowest risk, the class one devices. Your ventilators are gonna be up at your class three and that's because you're doing a serious body function for somebody. So you're going to be going in and, um, excuse me, you're gonna be going in and actually messing, like messing with people's bodies in terms of forcing air in and out. You're gonna be doing particular measurements uh, around the exhalation, the carbon dioxide there, as well as the oxygen that goes then. So the masks that people are wearing because they're more static and they're just kind of a protection beast, um, those are gonna fall into your class one, whereas your ventilators are gonna be in your class three. Um, EKGs, I believe are going to fall into more of the class two with those kind of CT scans and stuff like that, where you're monitoring externally from it, but it's not that high risk. You're not providing a critical body function. You're going to be instead taking a look electrically from it. Um, obviously, when you start to move into going up higher there where you're um, doing things like pacemakers, you're providing electricity critical to a function, those become severely more high risk. But EKG is typically just, hey, I'm going to conduct up electrodes. When you're thinking of class one, I would typically tend to think of anything that could be kind of loosely associated with like medical, like wheelchairs or um, the masks or gloves or something like that. Things are going to be used in a medical environment, but are not necessarily invasive to what people are doing. Awesome. Thanks, Keaton. All right. I think to wrap up, there are a couple of questions about like, who do we contact at Arrow, that kind of thing. I definitely recommend everyone reach out to Arrow through the link that Keaton had on the last slide. We will be sending out a recording of this as well as a link um, so you can get some more information and get connected with the engineers at Arrow if you have more detailed questions. Uh, so thank you so much to Keaton, our speaker today, and thank you everyone for attending our webinar. Um, have a great day, everyone, and we will see you next time.